From the pulpit of the First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas, this is Pathway to Victory with Dr. Robert Jeffers. Hi, I'm Robert Jeffers, and welcome again to Pathway to Victory. When someone violates your trust, it's one thing to find the grace to forgive their offense. But does that also mean you're supposed to pretend like nothing ever happened? Today, I'm going to show you the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation and explain why reconciliation is not a requirement to forgive another person. My message is titled, Forgiving People You Never Want to Eat Lunch With Again, on today's edition of Pathway to Victory. How many of you are old enough, take it from me by looking out here, I can tell many of you are old enough, to remember the old game show, Queen for a Day. How many of you remember Queen for a Day? Okay. You know, if you're not familiar with the game show, every day in the afternoon, uh, some unsuspecting housewife would be plucked from the audience. She would be given a crown and a scepter, and she would be treated royally for the next 30 minutes. So today, we're going to play a version of Queen for a Day. Instead of queen for a day, however, we're going to call it pastor for a day. Uh, your pastor has fallen ill, and you have been asked to sit in his chair for a day. And instead of being given a crown and scepter, you've been given a Bible and two counseling appointments. <laughs> How would you respond to each of these appointments? First of all, you're to meet with Frank, the chairman of your deacons. He has called for an appointment. He said, Pastor, I'm having a problem with one of our fellow church members, and I need you to help me. You always dread those kind of appointments when you're asked to don your black and white referee outfit and settle a dispute. But he's the chairman of the deacons, and so you have to meet with him. And when you meet with him, he says, Pastor, you know, you've asked me to serve on the Long Range Building Committee with a fellow deacon, Bill. And I've not told this to anyone, but a number of years ago, Bill cheated my son out of $25,000. And while I have forgiven Bill for what he's done, he's never said he was sorry for what he did. And I just can't serve on a committee with Bill when he hasn't shown any remorse whatsoever for what he's done. How would you counsel Frank? Would you tell him he really hasn't forgiven Bill if he won't serve on a committee with him? Is he harboring secret bitterness in his life because he refuses to work alongside a fellow church member? What would be your counsel? Your second appointment is with a very godly woman in your church named Sally. And she and John have been married for 10 years. They were high school sweethearts. They married shortly after graduation from college. The physical abuse actually began when they were dated. And they not only continued throughout their dating relationship, but through the first 10 years of their marriage, and it only increased in severity. Recently, Sally was able to persuade John to go to a marriage enrichment seminar at the church. And at the end of the seminar, the speaker gave people a chance to trust in Christ as their Savior. And he asked those who were willing to turn over their life to Christ to raise their hand. And to Sally's surprise, her husband John raised his hand, indicating he had become a Christian. That night when they got home, John expressed true sorrow for what he had done and asked for Sally's forgiveness. That lasted a couple of days. The abuse began again. And now it's worse than ever. Sally asks you, her pastor, what she should do. She wants to move out of the home. She's fearful for her own well-being. But some friends of hers have said, if you've truly forgiven your husband, you won't move out. You'll stay in that relationship and trust your well-being to God to allow him to protect you. You don't want to move out and give your husband a reason to divorce you. What would be your counsel to Sally? Should she stay in the home and trust her protection to God? Or should she move out? If she has really forgiven her husband, will she be willing to stay in that relationship? 
Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about the subject of forgiveness. And we've been looking at some misunderstandings about forgiveness that keep many people a prisoner of bitterness. For example, some people confuse forgiveness with repentance. And they think you cannot forgive somebody who's unwilling to say, I'm sorry. Of course, as we've seen, granting forgiveness is something we do unconditionally. It doesn't depend on what our offender does or doesn't do. We can forgive unconditionally so we can free ourselves from that person and get on with the life God has meant for us. Another barrier to some people forgiving is confusing forgiveness with consequences. I may be speaking to some of you right now. You're hesitant to forgive somebody because... Quite frankly, you don't think it's right to let them off the hook. You don't want to say this person should suffer no consequences for what they've done to me. But as we saw last time, when you forgive somebody, you're not letting them off the hook. You're not erasing consequences that God or other people may demand from them. When I forgive, I give up my desire for revenge, to hurt somebody for hurting me. But I could never give up my desire for justice. That means letting God or somebody else settle the score. Well, today we're going to look at a third barrier to forgiveness, and that is confusing forgiveness with reconciliation. Maybe you're one of those people today or watching on Pathway to Victory. You've been harboring bitterness for a long time. You really want that freedom to come that comes from forgiveness. You want to forgive, but honestly, you have no desire to be reconciled with that cheating mate or that slanderous friend, or that abusive boss. Have you really forgiven if you don't reconcile with that person? What we're going to discover today is, while I can and should unilaterally and unconditionally forgive people, I cannot unilaterally and unconditionally be reconciled with people. Forgiveness, that depends upon me. Reconciliation That depends on me and my offender. Now, make no mistake about it. Just because reconciliation is not unconditional does not mean it's unimportant. I don't want anybody to leave here today or turn off this broadcast and say, well, the pastor says reconciliation is optional. No, God always wants reconciliation. Over and over again, the Bible says God wants reconciliation. I don't care how bad your marriage is, God wants you to be reconciled to your mate. He desires reconciliation. That is always his desire. God wants reconciliation in marriages, in friendships, and in churches. That is always his ultimate desire. Over and over again, the scripture talks about the importance of reconciliation. For example, in Psalm 133, verse 1, the psalmist said, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell in unity. Or 2 Corinthians 5, 18. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and he gave us the ministry of what? Reconciliation. Or Ephesians 4, verses 3 and 4. Be diligent to preserve the unity of spirit in the bond of peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. Or Philippians 2, 2. Paul was writing to these feuding, fighting Philippians. And what did he say to them? Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit and intent on one purpose. Make no mistake about it. God wants you to be reconciled to that person who has wronged you. Reconciliation is important for two very specific reasons. Jot them down. First of all, reconciliation testifies of God's power. Your ability to reconcile with somebody who has wronged you is a testimony to the world of the power of God. Isn't that what Jesus said in John 13 verse 35? By this, all men will know that you are my disciples by your knowledge of my word. Is that what he says? By this, all men will know you are my disciples by how much money you give to the poor. Is that what he says? No. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. It is Christians' love and forgiveness of one another that is the most powerful witness to the world 
of the reality of the Christian faith. And the corollary of that is nothing is a poor witness to the world than the inability of Christians to get along with one another. That's why God desires reconciliation. Secondly, reconciliation empowers us to resist the enemy. It empowers us to resist the enemy. In Ephesians 6, 12, Paul said, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Do you hear what Paul is saying? The greatest struggle you're facing right now in your life is not with that jerky boss that you have to face tomorrow morning. It's not with that cold mate of yours who doesn't care about you like he or she should. Your greatest conflict is not with that business partner who's cheated you out of money. Paul said your greatest struggle is with the very real but unseen forces of spiritual darkness. Make no mistake about it. Satan has you in the crosshairs. He's put an X on your back. He has marked you for destruction. We are in that kind of war. It is a spiritual war. And that's why it is so important that we lay aside our differences and unite to fight the common enemy. Divorces, broken relationships, church splits, those are all opportunities not only to destroy our witness for Christ to the outside world, but these things cause us to open ourselves up to the enemy's attack and destruction of our own lives. Make no mistake about it, God's ultimate will in that marriage, in that friendship, in that relationship, his will is always reconciliation. But although his will is reconciliation, reconciliation is not always possible. Not with the person who has wronged us. In Romans 12, 18, Paul writes these words that perhaps you have overlooked before. Paul said, if possible, so far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. Notice he says, if possible. And as far as it depends upon you, be at peace with other people. Be reconciled with other people. But it doesn't always depend upon you. Forgiveness depends upon you. Reconciliation doesn't always depend upon you. In fact, a lot of people misunderstand this. They don't realize that in a relationship that has been broken... It is the offended party who holds all the cards when it comes to both forgiveness and reconciliation. You see, again, forgiveness is unilateral. It's unconditional. But reconciliation, for that to take place, there are at least four biblical conditions for a reconciliation to occur. I want you to jot these down. You can forgive somebody and should forgive somebody un unilaterally, unconditionally. When you forgive, you let go of your right to hurt them for hurting you. But before you're reconciled to that person who has wronged you, there are probably at least four things you want to see in that person's life. Number one is repentance. Repentance. What is repentance? It's a change of mind that leads to a change of direction. In Amos 3, verse 3, the prophet asked a very interesting question. He said, can two men walk together? Can two people walk together lest they be agreed? Now, that's a strange question, isn't it? Can two people have a relationship if they can't be agreed? I mean, maybe you like Mexican food and your wife likes Italian food. That, that doesn't mean you have a divorce, does it? You don't have to agree on everything to be married. You can be friends with somebody who has a different political affiliation. You know, Republicans and Democrats can be friends with one another. Does it require an agreement about politics? In a church situation... You know, premillennialists and amillennialists can get together and get along and worship the same God. Calvinists and Arminians can worship the same God. We don't require theologically, theological conformity on every minute point of doctrine. So what does he mean? Can two walk together lest they be agreed? There are some secondary issues we don't have to agree on. But for most people, the most basic issue we have to agree on is how 
you're treating me. You see, if you're in a relationship with somebody and you feel like they have wronged you, but they refuse to believe they have wronged you, well, it's going to cause a rupture in the relationship, isn't it? As long as you feel like they are not being honest and unwilling to admit the wrong and the hurt they brought into your life, that is going to cause a rupture in your relationship with that other person. And only when that person is willing to admit that they've hurt you and really show a care about the hurt they brought into your life, will that relationship ever be healed? That's true in our relationship with God, by the way. Should you ask forgiveness from God for your sins? You know, people who teach that you don't have to ask forgiveness for your sins, they don't understand the difference between judicial forgiveness and parental forgiveness. Two different types of forgiveness. It is true when you trust in Christ as your Savior, God does forgive you of all of your sins. I mean, after all, think about it. When Christ died for your sins, all of your sins were still future, weren't they? None of them had been committed yet. God wiped the slate clean. He declared you not guilty. You never have to fear hell again because of Christ's judicial forgiveness. But once you're a a Christian, it doesn't mean you stop sinning. And when you sin, it's not his judicial forgiveness you need. You need his parental forgiveness. Those of you who are parents understand that. You know, when your child who's living at home disobeys you, You know, hopefully you don't disinherit the child. You don't kick them out of the house and put them on the street. But until that child is willing to admit his or her wrong, there's going to be a rupture, a breach in that relationship with your child. The same thing is true in your relationship with God. Some of you right now are Christians. You're going to heaven one day. But there is a chasm There's a rupture, there's a breach in your relationship with God. You're at a standoff with God because he says you've hurt him and sinned against him and you're not willing to admit that. The Apostle John has a word about that in 1 John 1 verses 8 and 9. John says, if we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, sometimes we use that verse in talking to non-Christians, but this verse really wasn't written to non-Christians. John wrote this letter of 1 John to believers. He calls them little children. He said, if you as a Christian say to your heavenly father, I have no sin, you're deceiving yourself. But if you will confess your sins, he will forgive you. He will reconcile that broken relationship with you. Now, what is true in our relationship with God is true in our relationship with other people. For there to be a reconciliation, there has to be a repentance, a recognition of a wrong that's been done. Let me illustrate that. Let's say there's a husband and wife. They've been married for 20 years. And every Valentine's Day, the husband orders a dozen roses for his wife. On this Valentine's Day, he gets distracted at work and he forgets. So he comes home and his wife says, where are my flowers? Now, he's got a choice of how to respond. He could say, oh, I don't know what happened. I ordered them. The florist might have messed up. Now, if his wife happens to call the florist... It's going to be a chilly Valentine's night, isn't it? Or he could say, I know I forgot, but things just got so busy at the office. But you know what? That's no big deal. For 20 years, I've remembered, and I just forgot this one time. Forget this. Get off your high horse. We've heard a lot about that lately. Get off your high horse. Just look back on the 20 years, and let's let tonight go. What do you think her reaction is going to be to that? It's only when he's willing to admit He made a mistake. He acknowledges the hurt that it caused his wife and his reassurance that he'll try to make sure it doesn't happen again. That is the only way a reconciliation is going to take place. It's not that she's going to divorce her husband over this. Hopefully not. But there's going to be a coldness and a break in the relationship until there's genuine repentance. Number two, what does it take to effect a reconciliation? Not only repentance, but restitution restitution. Before I'm reconciled to somebody who has wronged me, I'm going to want to see some type of restitution. 
Now, it's very important we don't confuse revenge with restitution. I want you to write this down because it's so important to understand the difference. Revenge is the payment we demand from our offender. Revenge is the payment we demand from our offender. But restitution is the payment our offender volunteers to us. See the difference? If somebody has cheated you out of $50,000, you can forgive them. But before you go into business with them again, you're going to want to know, where's your $50,000? Genuine reconciliation takes not only repentance, but also restitution. Thirdly, rehabilitation. Rehabilitation. Before we're reconciled to somebody, we want to know that they've changed. We want to know that we're not going to become victims again. Now, rehabilitation is not the same as sorrow. You know, there are a lot of people who are sorry for what they've done. They're really sorry for the misery it's brought to their own life and the consequences of what they've done. I talk to wives sometimes who have separated from their adulterous husbands, and they say, you know what? Ever since I moved out, my husband is so sorry, and he's begging me to come back. Do you think I ought to move back in? I've said, do you really think he's repentant? Or is he just sorry he doesn't have anybody to wash his clothes, cook his meals, and sleep in his bed? There's a difference between sorrow and rehabilitation. Uh, rehabilitation means being sorry enough to change your behavior. Uh, Paul makes that distinction in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10. He says, for a real sorrow, a sorrow that is according to the will of God, that produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. There's a worldly sorrow that goes nowhere, positive. A godly sorrow will lead to a repentance, a change of mind leading to a change of direction and produces no regret. Before we build a relationship again with that adulterous mate, that abusive boss, that lying friend, we're going to want to see some evidence of change, rehabilitation. And number four, reconciliation requires a rebuilding of trust. You know, a marriage relationship can be broken in just a few moments of adulterous pleasure, but it may take years to restore and to rebuild the trust in that relationship. Rehabilitation doesn't happen overnight. It takes many times a long period of time. For example, if you have your Bibles, turn over to Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Paul talks about how we handle fellow Christians who are caught up, literally, or overtaken, ambushed by sin. And notice what the apostle says. He says, brethren, even if a man is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, lest you too be tempted. If somebody, a Christian, is overtaken by sin, and it happens to be a sin against you, you don't need to be the one to try to rehabilitate them. Another group of more mature Christians, or different Christians, need to work with him toward that rehabilitation that leads to a rebuilding of trust. And he says it takes other people to restore such a one. That word restore in verse 1 is a Greek word that refers to the mending of a broken bone. He says a fallen Christian is like somebody who has broken a bone. Now think with me about this. If you break your arm, what does it take for that arm to heal? Well, first of all, you have to put it in the right setting, don't you? You put it in a cast. It has to be in the right atmosphere to be able to heal. It takes the right setting and it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes time for that arm to heal. It's the same way with a Christian who has been caught up for sin. If he is going to truly be rehabilitated, it means he has to place himself in the right setting. There have to be other Christians who are meeting with him and helping him spiritually heal. He has to be in the right setting, and it also takes time. Again, don't expect a reconciliation to happen overnight. Many times it takes a rebuilding of trust. Now, here's the point I want you to remember. The things you desire from other people 
before they are reconciled to you. Don't be surprised if other people demand the same thing from you before you're reconciled with them. We've been looking at the vantage point of what we demand, what we desire before we're reconciled to the person who hurts us. We forgive them, but before we reconcile with them, these things have to take place. Remember, if somebody has been hurt by you, don't be surprised if they demand repentance, rehabilitation, restitution, or rebuilding of trust before they ever are willing to rebuild the relationship. What's the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation? No one says it better than the late Lewis Smedes. It takes one person to forgive. It takes two to be reunited. Forgiving happens inside the wounded person. Reunion happens in a relationship between people. We can forgive a person who never says he's sorry. We cannot be truly reunited unless he is honestly sorry. We can forgive even if we do not trust the person who wronged us not to wrong us again. Reunion can happen only if we trust the person who wronged us not to wrong us again. Forgiving has no strings attached. Reunion has several strings attached. Sometimes we need to forgive people even when they don't deserve it. They're not sorry. They don't carry any remorse for their actions. And frankly, you'd prefer if you never had to interact with them again. Yet God gives us the ability to show them mercy and grace. In fact, he actually commands us to do so. Well, just as forgiveness doesn't always result in reconciliation, next time we're going to look at another misunderstanding about forgiveness, and that is equating forgiveness with forgetting. Stay tuned for a preview of what's coming up next on Pathway to Victory. Forgiving somebody is not the same as trying to forget what someone has done to us. And as we're going to discover today, forgetting the hurts that have been inflicted against us, forgetting is neither the means of or the test of genuine forgiveness. Join us next time for the message, Forgiving Without Forgetting, here on Pathway to Victory.